Good morning. Welcome here to Treasure Valley Baptist Church on a beautiful October Sunday. Would you find your hymnal? We're going to sing a long, long-standing hymn of the faith, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, number 1919. And we're going to sing all the way through. I won't say anything else, but between verse number four and verse number five, we will kind of pause and change keys. So be careful about coming in on a different key. Between verses 4 and 5, we will change the keys. We're in number 1904, a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My Gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease, tis music in the and health and peace. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. He 
breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Number 127, the foulest is made clean through the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. 127. Oh, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it, and where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, for the wonderful grace of Jesus. The master's Ladies, Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Ladies, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, singing greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious. If you know the chorus, keep your head up out of the hymnal. If you can, we'll do something a little bit different on the last chorus. Sing the third now. Ready? Wonderful grace. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that, just that wonderful grace, Lord, that allows us to be here this morning, yes, allows us to have a home in heaven, yes, Lord, gives us so many things that we can be thankful for, Lord, we're thankful for this weekend and for the preaching that the men have already received, and we thank you for Brother Pe Peacock yes. and allowing him to be here, Lord, we pray that you would be with him this morning, 
as he brings us his, uh, your word. Pray that we be attentive and the Lord get something from it. Lord, we th pray for those that aren't able to be here for reason of health. Pray that you touch their bodies and heal them and bring them back here soon. Lord, we just give you the glory and honor for all that goes on this morning. Pray that you would be glorified in the singing, the special music, and the preaching of your word especially. We ask these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Amen. Well, great singing this morning and great crowd as Brother Peacock was admonishing some of the men this weekend on opening day of elk season. So thank you for all being here this morning. We are especially uh, grateful and thankful for all the visitors that we have. If you are a first-time visitor, if this is your very first time with us, we especially want to thank you. And uh, don't want to embarrass you or, or call you out or anything, but if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, if this is your very first time with us, thank you. We've got a couple in here. Thank you very much. We just want to let you know that we do have a visitor center, which is right in the middle of the foyer. So if you could stop by there after the service. The Johnsons are in the, the booth this morning. Great couple. They would love to give you a visitor's packet and answer any questions you might have. And again, thank you all very much for being with us this morning. And this morning, we're also welcome and pleased and thankful, I should say, to have Brother Peacock with us. Pastor Peacock is out of Jacksonville, Florida. We'll be hearing from him all day today. The men heard some great messages this weekend with our rally in the valley and had some great food, by the way. Uh, we, had some, we had a great dinner on Friday night, and then the ladies made a tremendous... I had to explain the whole meal to my wife when I got home. There was like three meals in one. It was just wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for all your help. We really mean that. And then I told my wife, though, I says, uh, Brother Peacock didn't come in and yell at us on how to be better husbands, but boy, I'll tell you what, if you get what he said on Friday and Saturday, it'll, I know it would make me the best husband I, I could possibly be if I get the altar and the axe head right. You guys know what I'm talking about if you were there. Just a wonderful, wonderful time. So, so thankful that he's here. Uh, this afternoon, just want to invite all of those that are part of the children's or youth choir to be sure to show up at 445, and that is one hour before we will hear from Pastor Peacock again tonight at 5.45, so please be sure to join us. And then there's a number of things in the bulletin. I won't go over them all, but if you grab one of those, it's got a lot of things coming up. One week from tonight, we've got a baptism service. Uh, two weeks from today, we've got our special lunch on the grounds and our sing, since it's going to be uh, a fifth Sunday. And then there's information in there also. Two and a half weeks, believe it or not, is our missions conference. And speaking of the missions conference, just want to remind you all that we do have our giving cards, our faith promise cards just the same card for anybody if you grab it there's a there's a section there where you can say how much you're giving per week month or year and again that is for uh, the the money that we give the missionaries so they can do the great work that we that uh, that they do out there and then one last thing i want to mention about excuse me two last things i should say about the foyer uh, one is we still have the, the uh, offerings, uh, the offering envelopes out there, so you can put your tithe, missions, or, or what have you into those, and the, we have the boxes in the back of the auditorium here where you could put those, but there is also the uh, option to give online. And then also, I was talking to Brother Charnett just before the service here, there is a tournament this week for the sports, for the Saints, uh, that is for all the sports. There is, uh, excuse me, there, I should get this right here, there's JV Volleyball, there's Varsity Volleyball, and there's Flag Football. And all the information's in the bulletin, but then there's also these tournament brackets that you can grab out in the foyer. And there's a different location. Uh, the varsity volleyball will be at Nampa Christian. JV will be right here at TVBC. And the flag football will be at West Park in Nampa. And again, all that information is in the bulletin. And all that information is also right there in the brackets so you can see the times in case you've got, uh, if you want to go there and cheer them on, I'm sure they would appreciate it. And also, if you have any questions, of course, you can see Brother Charnett. Again, thank you all very much for being with us here this morning. I want to remind the visitors once again, if you could, just stop by the visitor center right after the service. I, I know they'd love to give you a visitor's packet. And again, thank you all for being with us here this morning. And now we'll have a special. A soldier standing in the night, all geared and ready for the fight. Looking across the battlefield at the prize.
Encouraging. Will you please stand? This song 143 says some of the same things that they were saying, written many, many years ago. Same concept. Lord, let me look at you and go on. Be thou my vision. 143. Sing with me if you would on the first. Be thou my vision. Just men on the third. Riches I need not, nor men's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. I King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Sing together, all together to Christ this morning. High King of heaven, thy victory won, and may take a seat. Amen. Some pretty deep thoughts on that song. Amen. All right. Just a couple of things real quickly. One by way of reminder, uh, baptism service a week from tonight. So if you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized, uh, make yourself a candidate for that. Come forward at any invitation or see Brother Joe Pasola right up here in the front. Or call us down at the church office and we'll get you plugged into that. But we're going to have some folk baptized next Sunday evening. Uh, once again, thank you ladies for all your help, uh, especially the meal yesterday. But even more than the meal, your smiles, uh, your great spirit. And, uh, you know, with all those guys there, you guys were uh, a sight for sore eyes. I'll tell you that right now, okay? All right. But it was a great time. Brother uh, Peacock brought us some... Good messages, real challenges to us, and uh, again, so many helped, so many contributed, and we appreciate that help. Brother Peacock is a pastor from Jacksonville, Florida. He's been at the church for, did you say 30 years, brother? Oh, okay, all right. You can be up here if you want. You're going to have to come up eventually. <laughs> come on, brother. 
And uh, he's a good friend, Bible-believing man. And uh, we're really grateful that he was able to take the time from his busy schedule and be with us this weekend. Brother, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it is a real privilege to be here. I appreciate very much your pastor. I think one of the things that stands out probably more than anything, the few times that I've had the privilege of being here, is the kindness and the hospitality of everybody. You must be learning it from somebody because I was with just a bunch of men over the last couple of days. And men, not naturally, they're not normally hospitable by nature, but unbelievably hospitable, very, very welcoming and warm and uh, receptive to the messages. And I, I hope and pray your pastor has already given me the warning uh, to make sure that I'm going to have you out of here by 2 o'clock. And <laughs> that's what you said, right? 2 o'clock, preacher? 2 o'clock. We were up here this morning and he said to you also that you'd be hearing from me all day. That, it's really not that hard for me. I could probably do that for you. But I think what he meant was briefly this morning, then lunch, a nap, and hopefully briefly before I catch a plane tomorrow. But if you would like, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter number 4. I'll give you uh, something I think that maybe will be a help to you. I certainly hope it is. You know, oftentimes we read stories in the Bible and we as preachers have a tendency at times not to preach those stories that are often utilized because we feel like they're nursery rhymes and we feel like, well, everybody has heard them before. But I find the Lord oftentimes hides the, the greatest of treasures in the simplest of stories. I like the fact that when God came down here that if he could have wowed us with his intellect, he certainly could have done so. I mean, obviously, nobody is smarter than he is. He gave us all the intellect that we do have. And I like the fact that he uses things like, you know, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I like that because I can understand that. You have before you right now a literary classic. You don't have to go far in the Bible when you start reading the Bible. For instance, the prodigal son. Anybody that knows much about prose or about writing, they know clearly and understand clearly that that's written in a classical format. And whether you were to believe the Bible or not, you would have to recognize it as a classic and being in writing. And what you have in front of you now is a demonstration of a number of the Lord's attributes to us as human beings. You know, you find in the Bible that the Lord came not to be served but to serve, which seems to sort of be missing nowadays, even in churches where all of a sudden forgot the idea that the church is not here uh, for us but us for the church. We come to church nowadays, maybe not out here, but oftentimes in places where I go, it's what's the church going to do for me instead of what can I do for the church. And we find in the story here, just as a pretext to sort of set things up, you remember in Mark chapter number 4, uh, you remember that the Lord comes along and as he comes along, he begins to warn them about the importance of the word, the Bible, the seed he calls it, and he talks about sowing that seed. And he says, be careful because when the sower goes forth to sow the seed, before it can ever even get on the ground, the devil comes and tries to snatch it away. I think maybe it's good to be reminded that between my mouth or your pastor's mouth or Sunday school teachers or whoever it is that's teaching, that between their mouth and your ear, there is a demonic entity that is doing its best to try to distract you from receiving what God might otherwise have for you. He goes on in that passage as a, as a, as a plowman, as a professor, uh, as one that is teaching, a prophet even. He says, when the seed does hit the ground... Some of it will hit hard ground. And when it hits the hard ground, it's not able to absorb water or nutrients. And when the sun comes out and persecution comes, it, it gets burned up very, very quickly. And he said, and some falls among the thorns. I'll come to my passage here in just a moment. And he said, but then guess what happened? Persecution comes and, and the cares, the, the anxiety, the stuff that's going on in the world then just chokes things out. I find where I'm from and nowadays it's unusual because we're living in unprecedented times. Very few people were around in 1917. But now you're living in an unprecedented time and people are under constant bombardment from news media and things like that to the point 
that they're not able to hear when God speaks. God speaks, but it's quickly drowned out by a newscast before we can even get into the parking lot. And before we even get into our car and get back from lunch, we've turned in to the latest uh, post that has been put out. We've turned in to the latest information that's been turned out. We've turned into the breaking news that's out there that so easily, before we even think about it, it trips our trigger, our, our natural fight or flight syndrome kicks in and we immediately begin to panic and we forget all about, man, what a great church service and what a blessing it was to be in church and sing those hymns and hear those t- testimonies and be a part of a church service and I had such a peace that passes all under man it was so so good it was wonderful and boy we received the word with joy and it's great and then we turn on the news it's like oh man did you hear so people in China are moving against Taiwan, and I, I mean I'm I, um, okay well I don't live in Taiwan or China And I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but before long, the word that was so good intended to go in and begin to take root and begin to stabilize us in an unstable world. All of a sudden, the cares of the world, the anxiety steps in. And before long, instead of having the peace that passes all understanding, we find ourselves once again in turmoil and insomnia kicks in and we're beginning to have all kind of physical ailments and trouble because the body doesn't recognize the difference in physical pain and emotional pain and we become disraught and then we come back on Sunday night and it's like oh I I sure hope maybe I can get something tonight but it doesn't take long but then the good part sometimes the seed does get in and sometimes it does get just enough water for the roots to begin to get down into the ground and Sometimes, and that's the context of what the Lord is trying to set things up because he's going to tell you some things. By the time you come, if you could please, uh, we'll go ahead and pray. And then I want you to come to the end of Mark chapter number 4. Heavenly Father, would you please be with us this morning? And God, would you help me to help them? Help me, Heavenly Father, to give them something that would encourage and strengthen them. And help us, Lord, in a world that is coming apart to recognize that You've got it all sewn together. You have a purpose and a reason behind everything. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the interest of time, can I just say that we're all prone to storms. In verses 35 to the end of the chapter there, I'm, I'm setting something up to try to show you some things. All of us have storms in life, but we may have forgotten that the apostles are in a storm here, and it's a bad one. I'm not much of a sailor. I do live in Florida, and I don't really, haven't really been out on the sailboats as some of you have and been out there and caught up in some bad storms. I, I have been out deep sea fishing, and I have at times in those times of deep sea fishing had a storm blow up out of nowhere, and boats next to us, 29 and 35 footers capsizing and different things that were taking place and the Coast Guard coming out and looking for people that were out there. I'm aware of those kinds of storms and how scary it can be. I can't imagine if I was a fisherman for a living the type of storm that must have come up that would have scared these fishermen so bad they were in peril of their own life. And the Lord's asleep in the storm. And he comes up to the individuals there. They come and they wake him up from the nap. And Lord, don't you care that we perish? And, and it's almost with an irritated voice that the Lord is like, I'm on board with you. Do you not think I'm aware of what's going on around you? And I needed a nap. And you're more worried about self-preservation than me getting a nap. And he says to the wind and the waves, peace be still and the Waves began to lay down like a newborn baby put down in the crib. And the wind ceases to blow so much so that the only way that you're able to hear anything in movement on the water is the oars begin to slap the water because there's not even enough breath of a wind to raise the sail. And unbeknownst to them, God had the storm there in their life for the benefit of somebody who was up on a precipice at the beginning of Mark chapter number 5. 
Ladies and gentlemen, right now you are in an unprecedented time where people are watching you during the time of a storm more so than you've been watched in years and years and years. How does a Christian handle the epidemic, the pandemic, the whatever you would like to cause or call what's going on today? Unbeknownst to the apostles, they're headed now as the chandeliers of heaven begin to come out and the moon now pops out from behind those once cloudy skies and the thunder has ceased to roll, the lightning to flash and that light begins to dance out across that water as the moon is replaced with the sun coming up in the distance there and all of a sudden them being fishermen they recognize that boat is pulling up onto the devil possessed man's homeland, the possessed land or, or the man of gathering. I don't know about you but oftentimes we forget that storms in our lives are not always about us. It's not always because you did something wrong. Sometimes storms in our lives are there because of the fact that we are there for the benefit of somebody else. Second Corinthians chapter number 1 comes to mind very plainly. And he said, listen, in order for me to use you, I have to put you through storms so that when other people are in storms, I can use you to minister to them because you have been where they now are. But very few of us recognize when we're in a storm that the storm might not be because we've done something wrong. It might not be because Jonah's on the boat. It might simply be the Lord trying to make us into the minister that he would have us to be. What I can see is that boat comes in and the bow of that boat slides on that rocky shore and That devil-possessed man who's been perched there like a gargoyle up in that precipice and he's laughed and giggled as that storm comes up and he listens to them hollering and screaming. I can see them as that storm lays down. That devil-possessed man says, man, I sure wish that that man that yelled at that storm could calm the storm between my ears because many people right now are emotionally disraught. And they're not all demon-possessed. They're scared. They're in fear for their life. Listen, if they're not saved, do you understand? They don't know about heaven and hell. And if they do, they know they're going there. And they're really scared. You know what they need? They need somebody that's got it together, that's been through the storm and recognize, hey, I'm right here with you and I understand that. But I know where I'm going if something happens to me. How about you? Try not to get caught up and participate in their panic that's one of the things I love about the Lord is that every time everyone else is in a panic the Lord's kind of like cool as a cucumber and they wind up on that shore and here comes a devil possessed man running in their direction now I don't know about you but it is disconcerting to me to know that there is a naked man running in my direction I'm just saying for me that's a little uncomfortable On top of that, he's been cutting himself, trying to cleanse himself, and and he's bleeding on top of that. On top of that, he's dragging chains and fetters with him. If you can get it in your mind, his beard and his hair is soaked in spittle and sweat and rain and all kinds of other things. And, And this guy comes running at the Lord. And if I could paint, I would have the apostles jumping out like they would because they're the fishermen and they're getting all the stuff and finish bailing out the boat and they're pulling up, Lord, you don't know what's going on here. And all of a sudden they look up and they see this naked man come running down there screaming and hollering. And I'd have the old Peter, bold, you know, Peter, how he is. I'd have him sort of backing up and kind of like put one foot over the gunnels there and, and kind of halfway in and halfway out. I wouldn't paint them standing there boldly behind the Lord. I think the Lord would turn around and go, well, where'd everybody go? I mean, (laughs) what's going on here? My guys here, they're really going to defend me. I remember a lot of years ago, a lot of years ago now, we had a jumper on the ICW bridge and we blocked the bridge off and did all the things that you're supposed to do technically and through all your general orders and SOPs, there's a thing that you have to set up there. And I'm easing along there in the spotlight and kind of the place where they take that leap of faith in the past. And so I, I um, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> My wife said, honey, when you have to explain the joke, it's just not funny. I said, yeah, but they laugh. She said, honey, that's a pity laugh. That's not a real laugh. <laughs> 
And so I, I'm shining the spotlight, and to this day, I don't know where this fella came from, but somewhere, all of a sudden, he wound up on the hood of my car, right in front of me, on the driver's side of my car, and he's crouched down, holding on where the wipers are, and he growls, and he says, I'm a bear, I'm going to eat you. And he was naked. And I thought, not today, you're not going to eat me today. I very gently, keeping in mind the importance of safety for our citizens and things, I gently slid it into reverse and I very gently eased my foot off of the brake and onto the gas pedal and just gently began to remove myself, extricate myself, remove myself from the danger of the situation to, to be beneficial to him. And uh, for some reason he lost his footing and he began to slide off the end of the car hood and, and there was a glass between me and him and I, I couldn't kind of reach out and grab him and as gently as possible he fell on the asphalt and it was a little bit of a thud I mean and that kind of a thing and and so then he got up and took off running here's the crazy thing I put it in park and I jumped out of my car and I started chasing him now think about this I'm chasing a naked man that wants to eat me here it gets even worse I caught him and then I'm wrestling with this guy on the asphalt and I'm like, oh, this guy has no clothing on. So I'm hollering, somebody throw me a blanket. Back in those days we had these little silver rescue blankets. Oh no, they didn't take it out, shake it out. They were throwing the packs at me. You, you caught him, you clean him kind of thing. We took him to the hospital and all is well. And there was just a few little minor cuts and abrasions on him. But here's the illustration. A lot of times what would make us feel uncomfortable. A lot of times would make us think that God can't help us because we have too big of a problem. And a lot of times the problem we have is between our ears. I would say maybe looking okay on the outside but messed up on the inside and where other people would withdraw and back away from it the Lord stood there and that devil possessed man came right up there and with that sulfuric breath breathed right into his face and the Lord asks him a strange question he said what is your name now look we believe Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh right so we know he knows everything right but it's strange, it's not that he wants to know. He wants to know, does this man see himself the way he does? In other words, does this man know that he's got a problem? The man responds, my name's Legion. And I got more problems than Carter's got pills. And everybody's tried to help me. And nobody can do anything, so you know what they've done? They've separated themselves, they've removed themselves. They just stay away from me now. And the Lord said, I think I got something I can help. You know what happens within a short period of time? This isn't the message today. You find that man seated and clothed at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says, in his right mind. I, I'm not an opponent of medicine. So please don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way. But sometimes a good come to Jesus meeting can help to settle you for a longer period of time than medicines can settle you for a brief period of time. Again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not playing doctor. I'm just simply saying to you, why don't you try going to the king of peace and see Dr. Jesus for what's going on up here before you consider running to the physical doctor. Well, here comes the second thing. You see his power or demonstration of his power over elements there, and you see him now over devils. So I would say he's a psychiatrist if you want to use modern vernacular. Now I get to see him as a physician. And we say, well, why? Because he's going to demonstrate his power over a woman who has a disease. Here's my text for you if you would like. The Bible says in verse number 21, some of you are worried because it's like, when are you going to get in the Bible? I've been in the Bible, and, but I just haven't given you the passages yet. I've been in the living Bible. That's King James. Don't panic. Notice what the Bible says, verse number 21, Jesus passed over by ship to the other side, and people gathered to him, and was nigh unto the sea, and behold, cometh 
the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I, I pray thee, come lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, who is that? It doesn't say. That's called anonymity. I mentioned this to the fellows the other day. The author intentionally leaves her name out. You say, why? So that you can include yourself in the passage if you have similar problems. God knows who the woman is. He clearly understands. It says a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and suffered many things, many physicians, and spent all she had and was nothing better but rather grew where she heard and, uh, of Jesus. She came in the press and touched the garment. and She said, if I may but touch his clothes, I, I'm going to get all fixed up. So between her problem and Jesus, the great physician, there were a few things. Can I just expand, expound on that? Just maybe pull a few things for consideration for you. This woman had an issue, but it wasn't for a short time. And she wasn't quarantined for 14 days because she popped positive on a test. She had been in quarantine for 12 years. 360 days in this time per year, 24 hours a day, she wasn't allowed to go anywhere. It wasn't because she did or didn't have a card, did or didn't have a mark, did or didn't have whatever people are saying nowadays. It wasn't because of that. It was because everybody in that town knew that she had a very private, a very personal problem. She was one of those individuals that everybody in town knew what she had. If she dared show her face, everybody would be talking. And I would say this, she was ashamed, but here's the problem. There was nothing she could do. Whatever she had tried to to do she had done all and spent all the bible says she'd been to many physicians you got to give her props she had tried to get better but she was none better she was worse she tried every homeopathic remedy that there was she did everything that every doctor told her to do I feel like if I get the meaning, if I ring out that passage, I feel like without any question whatsoever, she didn't like having the problem. It removed her from society. If she had been married, she would not be able to be in contact with her own husband. If she had children, her children would be forbidden to be there. They would literally treat her like she was a leper. No one in the town would want anything to do with her because she was unclean. She was so dirty and filthy and I don't have any doubt whatsoever that maybe she had maybe shared her problem with some other people and people meeting maybe well-meaning privately as you heard in Sunday school she had asked some people to pray and publicly maybe they posted it on Facebook and now everybody knew her personal business I'm sure that they meant well, but we need to pray for sister issue. She's got some real problems. She's confided in me. I can't tell you everything about it, but it's bad. Now, we're going to get some people together and we're going to pray for her, but there's just really no hope. Can you imagine what it would feel like and how that would prevent her from seeking to go out in public because she felt that her purity problem was made public. She wants to come to Jesus and she's already tried to get some help, but I think she's resigned herself. This has been my life now for 12 long years. And everybody knows my problem but nobody can help me. You say, yeah, but preacher, at the end of the story where the Lord resurrects the little girl, you know, she died too. Yeah, but she was 12 years of age. She just got sick. This lady had been sick for 12 long years. And she heard Jesus was there. I don't know, somebody sent her a tract. 
Somebody get a door knocker on her door. I don't, I don't know how she heard, but somehow or another, somebody said, hey, there's somebody that can help you. She said, you got to be kidding me. I haven't got any money. And not only that, I can't go out in public. If I do, the priest could have me stoned. Wherever I go is unclean. Do you realize how ashamed I am because people are automatically thinking that I have this disease because I'm a sinner? That I'm in this storm because I'm a sinner. I've done something wrong. Do you recognize that I have been alienated, ostracized? I have been isolated from everybody. People think it's all my fault. The idea of stepping into public. Could I ask you a question? Does Jesus make house calls? No, he's just going to be passing by. If you need some help, you're going to have to go see him. Oh, I remember being in a prison one time, the old preacher preaching, and we were in about 75, I guess, or 80 women that were there and have really been through the ringer. He was drawing a picture of Jesus Christ and the two thieves and talking about whatever you've done, the Lord can cleanse you, and, and went through the entire story of the crucifixion. And there was a girl sitting on the very back row. It was so crowded in there, you, there was no place to sit. I stood back by the back door, and I'm watching. And I watched, boy, as those tears, man, they crashed down her cheeks, boy, like a water off of a mountaintop after a spring rain. And it began to hit that old naugahyde pew, bench, seat, whatever you want to call it, and slide off of that and onto that concrete, polished concrete floor. He got ready to give an invitation and that little lip started to quiver and it began to move like that. how a little baby's little lip will quiver. It's so pitiful and I thought, she's going to get saved. She's going to get saved. She's going to get saved. And she sat there and cried and then when he asked for public testimonies of people that got saved, she didn't raise her hand. Well, I was rolling up the picture there and so on and so forth and because of the fluorescent lighting over the top of my head, I felt the shadow that came over me there and I turned around I looked and it was her I said I said hey there how are you doing she said I'm doing okay she said don't hurt him I said sister he's seated at the right hand of the father you can't this is just a picture you can't you can't hurt him he's he's all right I said uh, I saw you back there when he was preaching did you ask him to save you he she said I'm way too dirty. I immediately turned. A passage you would have probably said also, Come, let us reason together. Though you sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. I said, listen, the Lord can cleanse you. If he can cleanse me, she goes, you don't know what I've done. I said, I don't need to know what you've done. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and, and God can save you and clean you up. She said, I don't think he. And she began to cry again. I looked at the chaplain over there. She's a female chaplain. Been there 38 years. I said, Chaplain, could you maybe help this young lady? They sat down on the row. The rest of the girls were going back to their cells now. And before long, I saw that chaplain and her get down on the edge of that chair there. And she asked the Lord to save her. The correctional officer came in the back of that room there and said, it's time to go now. And we have to go. And, and the chaplain said, just a moment. She said, no, ma'am, it's time to go. She's got to go back to her cell. And so she began to walk out. I didn't get a chance to say anything. And she went down the side of that building right there. And, and as she went out there, I said, hey, did you get anything fixed up? You know what she said? I'm clean now. I'm clean now. You know what she said when she came to him? I'm so dirty, nobody can clean me. You know what she said when she left? She didn't change on the outside. She still had skin poppers on her and black popcorn teeth. And even though she was in her very early 20s, she looked like she was at least 40. I mean, you could tell where sin with its iron shod hooves had stomped all over her face and taken the purity out of her. But her countenance was different when she walked out. She said, I'm clean now. I'm clean now. Well, between this woman... And Jesus, there's a problem. You know what the problem was? She had to get over herself first. You wouldn't be reading about her if she wasn't willing to get up. But I want you to recognize the pull of gravity against her. I want you to understand for her to risk stepping outside in public meant public ridicule if not public execution. It literally was a very difficult thing for her to consider going outside. She heard Jesus was passing by and 
she grabbed her shawl from off the couch and opened that old screen door in the back and that spring stretched to its fullest capacity and down just a couple of rickety wooden steps she went and the door slammed and she cringed and thought, man, they're going to know I'm out. And down through the back pathway she begins to go. And she's making her way over a couple of blocks. She sees the dust cloud and hears the clamoring of people there and she said he must be there. And her weak, frail, anemic, emaciated body begins to go with her bowed over and her, her, her hoodie, her, her shawl, her, her burqa, whatever you want to call it is. She's just covered up in shame and she's trying her best to just one step at a time. If I could just, if I could just get to him, if I could touch the hem of his garden. Hey, sister, you recognize the hem of his garment. You recognize that not only identifies him, you recognize that's down in the dirt. But if I could just get to Jesus... She is in such dire need of help because she has an issue. She's bleeding to death. You know what I know about Christians nowadays? Especially those of us that are King James, independent, fundamental, rightly dividing, street preaching uh, Christians. We know how we're supposed to act. And we get dressed up on the outside and our curb appeal is excellent. Is that a fair statement? But you don't buy a house based on how it looks on the outside. Because I know that when the door closes, things go on in your marriage and things go on with your kids and things go on with your business and things go on with your finances and things go on that we don't let anybody else know about because if they knew about them, boy, would that wreck our reputation as you heard about in Sunday school and people would know maybe we're not the independent fundamental fireball Baptist that we claim to be. And she goes out. I see her as she begins to work up there and the Bible says that she couldn't get to him for the press. Can I just touch this for just a second? Press there means the people I understand but I know some people right now that are trying to get to Jesus but The press has derailed them. CNN and Fox and MSNBC, Facebook feeds, Drudge Report, all of the alternative websites that are out there, the conspiratorial. Hey, I got to get to Jesus. Yeah, but if you step out, you better be in 95'd. You better bleach everything. I wouldn't go to church, but it's okay to go on an elk hunt because that's outside. It's okay to go to a ball game. It's okay to go to Walmart. But I better not go to church. You get cooties at church, but you don't get them at the restaurant. In Florida, we have the smartest virus you've ever seen. You walk in a restaurant, you have a mask. You got to have a mask. You have a mask. You have a mask. As soon as you sit down, that virus knows, oh, man, I'm in quarantine. I can't go past the edge of the table. <laughs> and you can sit there. and No social distancing. I mean, you're across the table. You're sitting next door to people. They're sitting right on top of you. you know, it's kind of like no big, because that virus knows. Oh, no, uh, you got to stay right here in this little bubble. But don't come to church. I'm not getting on to you. I'm sure you folks, I'm glad there's a bajillion people here today. I'm simply saying it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, aren't you sort of putting uh, your own preferences there? It's not possible that our preferences could keep us from Jesus, is it? It's not possible that our prejudice could keep us from Jesus, is it? It's not possible that our politics could keep us from Jesus. Is it? I can't imagine this woman coming in and she's looking to get to Jesus and she's greeted. Now, this is the South by open carry, you know, hand on the hip. Never been a policeman a day in her life, but got me a license now. She called me Wyatt. 
Can't carry it at work or on school ground. Strapped at church. Watching out. You know, might be under attack. You never know when one of them towel heads might come in. And then she walks, and the first thing she sees is, wow, okay. How you there doing, huzzy? I mean, excuse me, sister. You are saved, aren't you? No, I'm just looking for Jesus. Like to know who you voted for in the last election. Pardon me? I'm, I'm looking for Jesus. You Democrat or Republican? You, wh- what? I'm, I'm looking for Jesus. They told me Jesus comes by here. And I'm, could, could I just get to Jesus? Uh, well, it depends on what side of the fence you own. You ain't one of them people rigging them elections, are you? Uh, sir, I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, but it's almost sounding to me like you don't really want me to get to Jesus. I got to kind of go through guards. I, I, I thought I remember reading a passage over there where the apostles were getting between Jesus and the kids, and he said, suffer the little children coming to me. And, and she, she said, I'm just trying to get to Jesus. But I, I mean, I'm sure it would not be that way here. But I do know places where politics, preferences, prejudices, Get between those people trying to get to Jesus and us. The misconception is, is you got to be like me to get to Jesus. Might I remind you, there were a lot of people that were around Jesus at the time. And when this gal finally reaches out and touches Jesus, you know what he says? Who touched me? And then boys stepped up and said, we ain't been three years of Bible school for nothing. Lord, we can answer that question for you. Everybody's touching you. He said, man, your idea of touch and mine are two different things. Somebody here knows they have a need. The rest of these people are here for a photo op. They just want to get an opportunity to see a sideshow. The Bible says, she goes, if I could paint, I would have her emaciated. I'd have her faceless because she's nameless. But I would have her where you could identify what her problem was by just looking at, oh, she's, oh, oh. She's the woman with the issue. You know, lives down there where the grass ain't cut. And, you know, she's, she's that one. Now, we, I'm not saying that we know, but the type of disease she has, all I can say is I don't have it. And I don't know why, you know, God's been so good to me. He's just been so gracious to me. But I don't know that we want somebody like that around us. It's not contagious. Yeah, but what'd that do for the name of our church? To have them kind of people around, you know. I think when Jesus turns around, she's down there. If I could paint, I'd have her reaching out there. I'd have her down now, knocked down, jostled down by the crowd. And the crowd doesn't care at all about her. And I would have her reaching out there and just barely gets her fingertips on her. I'd have them standing on her hand. Because they're not interested in her. And as soon as she touches him, I'd have him stop. And turn around and I'd have him looking right at her. And now I would have her face. And he would say, who touched me? I have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of my infirmities. The broken heart. Crushed. Like an egg under a giant's heel, the cancer, the loss of a child, the sickness, the debilitating, disabling sicknesses. I don't have a Savior that's like, hey, get over it. I got a Savior that said, come here and let me help you. Somebody that can help me with that, I'd have him looking right at her. Who touched me? I think if... I understand the passage. She would be thinking he's going to take it away because the Bible said as soon as she touched him, she said, man, I haven't felt this good in 12 long years. Man, this is amazing. I can't believe how good I feel. Wow, praise the Lord. Glory to God. 
thank you, Jesus. The Lord's like, I'm liking that. But she's not saying it out loud. And everybody turns around and goes, oh, it's you that stopped the parade. Now you're in the spotlight. I was just looking for Jesus. I really wasn't looking for the spotlight. I've learned about spotlights. That shows all your flaws, and it's hot under there. I, I was just looking for Jesus. I was going to touch him and get out of here. I, I wasn't going to bother you folks. I, I, I'm really sorry. I, I just knew that he was the only one that could help me. Stay with me. I'm almost done. Because she was bold enough and brave enough to admit that she had an issue. Anger and wrath and bitterness and strife and even grief that assuages or overpowers it. It takes over. It prevents us from getting out of that locked-in quarantine even if we're sitting in church and say, I can't give that up. I can't. And we're sick and we're bleeding to death. We're hemorrhaging. But if somebody would look at us, oh, no, they never expect that out of you. Two weeks ago, I had a man that called me looking for some help on something and he said preacher I really don't know how to handle this I said okay well I can maybe try and he said I have a man who's been married 50 years he's a deacon in my church he literally left his wife left the church and has now gone and joined himself to another woman he said I never saw it coming you say why because it's a personal responsibility because there's things you know and God knows that nobody else knows they're private things they're secret things and those things can eventually take root and when you didn't expect it then the pressure comes and all of a sudden you snap like a twig in an afternoon thunderstorm well, she's touched him now. I see in my idea, in my mind's eye, every kind of thing you can think about as far as people. Hypocrites in the church. Somebody put out somebody else's apple pie or potato salad in the South. Tater salad's a big deal. And they make tater salad there and and if they don't get it out there, I mean, they put their name on the dish so they get the dish back. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is, but the, dish, the name of the dish is always kind of like, <laughs> the dish is the same on both sides. We have it sitting here like this, you know, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, but except when it comes to tater salad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's. And I don't know how it is that they get this idea of this conspiracy going on. And what they think is, is that somebody put someone else's tater salad in front of theirs and it got eaten before theirs and then they brought theirs out of the kitchen and put it down there last. And it's like, yep, yeah, that old huzzy in the kitchen, you know what she done? She put her salad out there. They'd have ate mine. That thing was passed down to me and passed down to my great, 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 great grandma. That comes from out yonder when Bessie Ross was making the flag right before Paul Revere went to riding. My great, 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 great grandma was in the kitchen making tater salad and passed it on down the line. But oh no, they ain't going to get a chance to taste that. They got to have flossy maize. Before long, man, she's sitting there swole up like a cow with a bloat. And you're thinking about running that little thing in there between their ribs to kind of let all that out. But you're thinking, if I do, it's going to smell. <laughs> and so you just got to let them swell. And you're thinking, Lord, God, I hope you release some of that before you pop. Now, you probably don't have that here, but you realize that sometimes that can keep you Something that simple. The color of the walls. Who parks in a certain parking place. The possessiveness becomes to the point where somebody else steps in and says, Hey, you know, I, I, you know what you doing with that toilet brush in your hand? 
Well, there was something in the toilet. I figured I'd go scrub down. That's my job. Well, if you'd have been doing it, we wouldn't have a mess in there right now. Well, I wait till everybody recognizes there's a mess and then have them call me 911. I'll take care of it. Well, I was just going to get it done. You wouldn't even have to worry about it. Listen, I'll tell you what. I'll do it. Hand you the toilet brush and you can tell them you did it. You say, surely not. Yeah. Certain little issues. How come he sang? How come she sang? Why did they get chosen to do that? You know what that can do? It can keep you from getting to Jesus. Well, I'll close out the story this way with just a, a simple illustration. Devil-possessed man's walking along one day. He's, he's all suited up now, and he's got his parole papers in his back pocket. He's probably going to get profiled by the police because everybody knows him, you know, so he's got to get checked on a regular basis. And FBI's probably listening in on his phone calls and stuff like that. They're waiting for him to mess up. But he recognizes that goes with who he is. It don't even bother him anymore because Jesus has done something for him. He ain't bitter no more about it at all. And he runs into a feller at the street out there. And the feller says to him, said, hey, man, who are you? He said, oh, that's a long story. He said, well, tell me about it. He said, you know, you probably don't really want to know the whole story. He said, no, I'm, I'm really interested in it. He said, we better go get a cup of coffee. They sit down there in the restaurant. Waitress brings over a couple of cups of coffee. And he said, uh, I used to live up in Gadarene. And he tells the story that I told you a few minutes ago. And the guy said, I used to read about you. I know who you are. He said, what happened to you? He said, well... There were some apostles in a storm, and the Lord calmed the storm, and I was praying and just asking, God, could you do something for me? And the very guy that calmed that storm came up there and calmed the storm in my mind. I've never been the same. About that time, the waitress comes up. She says, top you off, boys? Let me warm you up. And she looks, and she goes, wait a minute. I had not seen you in years. She said, the fellow visitor says to him, said, well, you know him? Oh, yeah. The Lord stopped by and talked to him before he ever dealt with me. Really? Yeah, he used to live up in the Gadarenes. Well, who are you? What's your name? She goes, uh, I'm the woman with the issues. Oh, you're that woman. See, history can sometimes stay with you. And she said, yeah. I'm that woman. But I got to Jesus. And she pours that coffee in those cups and she said, "And I've never been the same. Here comes a beautiful little teenage girl. Walks into the restaurant. And she walks up and she looks at that waitress and she goes, I know you, I haven't seen you in years. She goes, you sure you know me? She goes, yeah, you're the one that interrupted my daddy. My daddy was Jarius, and I was dying over there, and, and I died. Now the visitor's like, whoa, wait a minute, devil possessed, diseased, and dead. I, what in the world? She goes, greatest thing ever happened to me. Most wonderful thing in the world, I died. He goes, but you're not dead now. She goes, Exactly. And he looks at her and he says, and you're not diseased anymore, she said, that's right. And he looks at him and says, and you're not devil possessed anymore, he said, that's right. And they all said, man, we are so grateful. He said, because he cast out the devils, because he healed your disease, and because he raised you from the dead. They said, oh, no. That's for shallow, immature Christians. They're grateful for what God did in healing them. No, 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 the devil-possessed man said, I'm grateful for every demon that ever crawled in me because if it hadn't been for that, I'd have never met for Jesus. And before he can finish, the lady with the issue said, oh, I am so grateful for the 12 years that I was sick because had I not been sick, I probably would have just been a passerby in the crowd and I would have missed Jesus. And the little girl said, and if I hadn't died... I'm so grateful I died. 
about that time, in my mind's eye, here comes a guy, his skin looks like that of a baby. And the guy goes, and who are you? He goes, some people call me the leaping leper. He said, yeah, what's your story? He said, well, there was 10 of us, but I'm the guy that went back. Because see, the Lord made me clean. And I was following the Lord's orders and the protocol. I went back to, to just go to the priest, and I got to thinking, man, I need to go back and say thank you. Oh, so you thanked him for curing for leprosy? He goes, no. I thanked him for the leprosy. I thanked him for the storm in my life. I thanked him because that distinctive thing is what drove me closer to him and caused me to have a relationship with him and a peace that passes all understanding. Oh no, thousand times no. I'm not saying thank you for making everything good. I'm saying thank you because I realize now you did this so that I could get to you and it makes you look good. You're in difficult times. We're landing the plane now. And times are hard and difficult and we begin to think, Lord, what have I done? What have I done wrong? And what should I do different? And I just don't, I just don't really get this, Lord. And, and we get almost anxious. We get almost angry. We get almost frightened. Instead of saying, you know something, Lord? The Bible says give thanks in all things. Lord, you know what I'm learning? I'm learning that you sent this stuff my way in order to have an opportunity to minister to me and so I can have that personal relationship. When was the last time you thanked God for trouble? Do you want to make sense out of your trouble? Things that look really, really bad are really, really good. Well, the story closes. The woman goes back. She sets her table that night. And around that table are now people that she can have fellowship with. I'm going to guess the topic of the conversation wasn't her disease. Her 12 years of torture. I'm going to guess. That she said, hey, can we join hands? You know, I haven't been able to have a personal touch with anybody. Nobody would touch me. Can we just hold hands for a second? Can we just pray and thank the Lord that he touched me and he cured my infirmities? But can I say my thanksgiving is, Lord, thank you for the infirmities. And with that, she bows her head. And the tears of joy begin to stream down her cheeks. And the story begins to run through, I always thought I was beyond help until I met the great physician. And your pastor comes and closes the service as he sees fit. Heavenly Father, we'd ask as we close the service, there are some people here I have no doubt that have issues, problems, difficulties. And Lord, I know it's hard to get up out of that rocking chair. I know it's hard to get out of that easy chair. I know it's hard to, to get out of that house and to come and pray heavenly father that you might help us to get up find our way to you recognizing there's going to be opposition along the way difficulties and troubles are going to try to stand in the way trip us up on our way there help us today lord at this moment in time to find our way here young and old male and female husband and wife families that we might recognize that you have the medicine that we need. That you might help us, God, as only you can help us. We'd ask now you might bless this time of invitation. Help the emaciated. Help those plagued with issues to make their way down to see you this morning and fall at your feet. And help them, Lord, as only you can, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Could you remain in prayer? Some folks have already come. There are folks here that will help you if you need help with salvation. But there are folks here that would gladly come to pray with you if you need them to pray with you.
If you just take a moment or two to pause and consider, it's, it's not too late. God spoke to you, we'll wait on you. God's dealing with you, don't miss that opportunity. Sometimes it's not conviction, it's just, Lord, I need help. I'm struggling, I just got anxiety, I'm just nervous. I, I don't know which way is up, Lord, please, could you just please just help me? I, I don't even know how to put a label on. Folks are still coming. This is the most important part of everything is an opportunity to come and to tell him. Would you stand with me this morning? We'll sing 687. 687. In the dark of the midnight, have I oft hid my face while the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place mid the crash of the thunder. Precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky.
Till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. When the long night has ended and the storm comes no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright peaceful shore in the land where the tempest never comes. Lord, may I dwell with thee till the storm passes by. Sing as loud as you can now. Till the storm passes over. Amen. Yes, sir. Till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. All right, let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer. And then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I know there's nothing else that needs to be said here. Just ask that those things that you're speaking to each heart would be stamped deep. And Lord, we might lay hold upon you. And by faith, Lord, claim the victory that's necessary in each and every situation. So many hearts represented. And in many cases, more than one challenge in each heart, Lord. So as we come to you, Lord, help us to realize all we need to do is touch the hem of your garment. And Father, you'll do the rest. Dismiss us here with your blessing. Bring us back tonight. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.